good evening aspirants welcome to the hindu news analysis by shankar ias academy for the date 11th of september 2022 displayed here are the list of news articles we will be discussing today Let's start our discussion. Take a look at this article. This article talks about neuromorphic computing. The article also talks about the ongoing research for use of organic elements in designing neuromorphic computational systems. It talks about the research project taken up by the scientist in Indian Institute of Science Bangalore. It says that the scientists are trying to design neuromorphic system using organic materials. it is unheard of right note that this form of research hasn't been done anywhere else in the world till now so this is a new and up and coming technology according to the scientist the advantages of using organic materials include improved cognition and decision making ability this is because of the high interconnectedness of the organic systems this is the crux of the news article so through this discussion we will see about the term neuromorphic computing and also the advantages and disadvantages of using neuromorphic computing now let's start our discussion first let us take the term neuromorphic computing what is it it refers to the method of using computer engineering in which elements of the computer are modeled after human brain and the human nervous system so basically in neuromorphic computer the hardware and the software are designed to mimic the functioning of human brain and the human nervous system this is the basic about neuromorphic computers or neuromorphic computing now let's come to the advantage the first advantage is the capacity see our human brain which weighs only 1.3 kilograms can store data up to 2.5 petabytes that is 2.5 million gigabytes but in case of the modern computers even after so much development the modern hardware that can store just 1 terabyte of data weighs up to 300 grams so compared to the memory capacity to weight ratio the human brain or the organic systems have a huge advantage okay the next advantage is the neuromorphic computers take less physical space see this also can be easily understood by comparing a brain and a computer our brain just fits into our cranial system but the computer is huge right so when we start using computers designed using organic systems the size will be very compact then there is the speed of computing the computers designed using this technology will have a higher advantage in its computing capacity this is because of their interconnected nature then there is energy consumption the energy consumption of neuromorphic computers are very low see brain needs far less energy than most super computers our brain uses only about 20 watts whereas the fugaku super computer needs 28 megawatts to function here fugaku super computer is the world second fastest super computer so to put it in other way our brain needs only 0.00007 percentage of the fugaku's power supply the last major advantage is computers designed using neuromorphic system will require very less cooling system see super computers as it exists today needs a elaborate cooling system most of the power consumption in a super computer is used in the cooling system but our brain is very small and it sits on our cranial system without any elaborate cooling system itself our brain keeps its heat at the moderate level of 37 degree celsius so all these are the advantages of using neuromorphic computers let me repeat the advantages again it has higher storage capacity it requires less physical space the next advantage is the speedier computing capacity 
then there is the low energy consumption and finally there is no need for elaborate cooling system these are the advantages of neuromorphic computing but this also has some disadvantages let us see the disadvantages first is the fragility all the organic systems by nature are very fragile compare our brain and a computer which is very fragile our brain so this is the first major disadvantage of neuromorphic computing the next advantage is the unstableness see our brain or all organic matters for instance are made up of chemical components these chemical components are highly unstable they require perfect conditions to remain in a stable state this is unlike the solid computers that we use today so this is the second disadvantage of neuromorphic computing okay see scientists are of the view that if these two problems can be addressed organic materials can outperform any other material in computing technology okay so that's all regarding this discussion see in this discussion we saw about the term neuromorphic computing we saw about its advantages and its disadvantages so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this article this article talks about cloudburst why is cloudburst in use because cloudburst has recently caused floods damage to property and loss of life in many parts of india so this article focuses on cloudburst it mainly focuses on our inability to correctly forecast cloudburst this is the crux of the article given here so in this context we will cover cloudburst in a 360 degree angle so in our discussion we will focus on what is cloudburst why cloudburst happens the difference between cloudburst and thunderstorm the areas that are prone to cloudburst in india the difficulties in cloudburst forecasting the consequences of cloudburst and finally the possible solutions to adapt to cloudburst so this is the plan for this discussion today see this discussion is important because cloudburst can be asked in the prelims as well as in the mains examination in the mains examination it can be asked in gs paper 1 and it can be also asked in gs paper 3 as a part of disaster management so the topic we are going to discuss today has multiple uses so listen carefully now let's start our discussion first let us take the definition of cloudburst see the cloudburst has the word cloud and burst in it so you must not associate the word with cloud exploding because it is a misnomer actually cloudburst is defined as a extreme amount of precipitation in a short period of time within a small geographical area according to indian meteorological department an unexpected precipitation exceeding 100 mm or 10 cm per hour over a geographical area of approximately to 20 to 30 km square is labeled as cloudburst so this is the basic definition of cloudburst simply put when large amount of precipitation that is over 10 cm happens in a area of 20 to 30 km square it can be called as cloudburst how does this happen the cloudburst happens when saturated clouds are unable to produce cloud because of the upward movement of warm air instead of dropping down the rain drops get bigger in size and they get pushed up due to the rising parcels of warm air then the cloud becomes too heavy to hold the moisture and they drop down the rain suddenly this is how normally cloud burst happens see this phenomenon that we discussed right this is how cloud burst happens in the plains in the mountainous region the cloud burst happens due to the phenomenon called orographic lift here orographic lift is the upward movement of the clouds after the cloud has struck the mountain the upliftment of the cloud due to the orographic lift results in the formation of cumulonimbus clouds and these clouds precipitate suddenly and causes cloud burst so this is how cloud burst happens in plains and orographic region having seen the definition of cloud burst and the reasons for cloud burst now let us see the difference between cloud burst and thunderstorm see what is a thunderstorm thunderstorm is a violent short lived weather disturbance that is almost always associated with lightning thunder dense clouds heavy rain or hail and strong winds 
See, this is similar to cloudburst, right? Like we saw, cloudburst is also an extreme event that is associated with large amount of precipitation over a short period of time within a small geographical area. Here, the major difference between cloudburst and thunderstorm is, unlike thunderstorm, the cloudburst is not always associated with lightning, thunder, hail or strong winds. So, this is the only difference between cloudburst and thunderstorm. Thunderstorms are always associated with lightning, thunder, hail and strong winds. But cloudbursts are not always associated with these events. Okay, this is the difference between cloudburst and thunderstorm. Now, let us see the areas in India that are prone to cloudburst. See, in India, the Himalayas and the northeastern hills are most prone to cloudburst. This is because, as we saw, in these areas, orographic lift normally happens and due to orographic lift, cloud burst happens. See this map here. This map shows the occurrence of cloud burst between the month of April and September in 2022. If you notice here, most of the cloud burst happened in the Himalayan states and the northeastern region. See, cloud burst in India is not just limited to Himalayas and the northeastern region. It also occurs in the Western Ghats also. In Western Ghats, the cloud burst happens mainly during the monsoon season. See, during the monsoon season, moisture-laden winds from the Arabian Sea approach the Western Ghats. Once they reach the Western Ghats, they are orographically lifted. Once this happens, cloud burst happens. This is why during monsoon, you can hear news about flooding in Kerala and Karnataka. Okay? So, these are the areas in India which are frequented by cloud burst. Now let us see why cloud burst is difficult to forecast. First is low resolution satellites. See, in India, weather events, mainly monsoon, are forecasted using satellite images. These satellite images have low resolution. But like we saw, the cloud bursts are very local events. They occur within an area of 20 to 30 kilometers only. Since they are very local and very small, the low resolution cameras that are used by our weather agencies are not able to capture the events. The next thing is they happen within a few hours. So this also makes capturing of the images of the cloud burst very difficult. So due to this, forecasting of cloud burst also becomes very difficult. The next thing is uncertainties. See, like we saw, cloud burst in India mainly happens in Himalayas, northeastern hills and the western Ghats. These areas are rugged region. Okay. Here, when the moisture laden winds hits the hill and started undergoing orographic lift, the weather becomes highly uncertain. This uncertainty happens within a very small time frame. This uncertainty that happens in that small time frame makes the forecasting of cloud burst very difficult. This is the second difficulty in forecasting cloud burst. The last is economics. See, Doppler radars are used to calculate the velocity of the moving clouds. Here, Doppler radar is a kind of radar that uses microwaves and the Doppler effect to calculate the speed of the incoming cloud. See, this radar is very costly. To correctly forecast the cloud burst event, large amount of Doppler radars must be placed all around India. This will take a huge amount of investment. Since this is very difficult and very expensive, the forecasting of cloud burst also becomes expensive. So these are the three main reasons that makes forecasting of cloud burst difficult in India. Having seen this, now let us see the consequences of cloud burst. See, like we already saw, cloud burst happens mainly in the rugged terrain regions of India like Himalayas, Northeastern Hills and the Western Ghats. In these areas, the slopes are very steep. Due to this, when rainfall happens, rapid flow of water occurs. This causes lot of destruction of property, lot of destruction of human life and also since the top layer of the soil is eroded, it also causes destruction to the cultivable lands and crops. The other consequences of cloud burst include, first is flash floods. See, flash flood is the most dangerous kind of flood. In most cases, during flooding, only inundation of the land takes place. But in case of flash floods, water starts moving at a 
very high speed okay and this happens when the high rainfall exceeds the ability of the ground water to absorb water so once the ground level gets completely saturated with water flash floods occurs the next is the debris flow debris flow is also a kind of flash flood but instead of just water flowing the debris also flow with the water the next is the mud flow mud flow is also a kind of flash flood but instead of just water or debris mud starts flowing with the water this also happens due to saturation of the ground with water okay see all this results in land caving that is flash flood debris flow and mud flow results in transporting large amount of debris and mud from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill due to this land starts caving in see these are the major consequences of cloud burst having seen the consequences of cloud burst now let us see the steps that can be taken to mitigate cloud burst first is permanent deployment of national disaster response force see what we can do is we can create a map highlighting the cloud burst prone areas in our country in these particular areas alone the national disaster response force can be permanently stationed so when the cloud burst finally happens the force can go and help the people who are suffering the next thing is capacity building see in the cloud burst prone areas people who are residing can be provided proper training this training can help the people to adapt to the cloud burst events next is the proper use of technology see using doppler radar all over the country is very expensive but if we properly map the cloud burst prone areas in our country it will be a very small area in these areas around doppler radar can be deployed once they are deployed the radars can be used to do forecast the cloud burst events by forecasting the cloud burst events the damage to the property and the people can be easily mitigated the next thing is proper drainage system see one of the consequence we saw due to cloud burst is flash floods flash floods happen when the ground is saturated with water and the water starts flowing at high speed why does the ground start saturating with water this is because there is no proper drainage system in the area so in the cloud burst prone areas alone if we develop proper drainage channels when the cloud burst events occurs water can be easily evacuated so when water start flowing without any obstruction disasters like flash floods won't happen next is avoiding illegal construction in the cloud burst prone areas illegal construction should be prevented and water bodies in these areas must be preserved and finally in the cloud burst prone areas afforestation activities can be encouraged once afforestation activities are encouraged the trees and the plants hold the top soil together once this happens disasters like flash floods mud flows and debris flows can be prevented so these are the steps that can be taken to mitigate cloud burst so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw what is cloud burst then we saw what causes cloud burst then we saw the difference between thunderstorm and cloud burst after that we saw the reasons why forecasting cloud burst is very difficult in india then we saw areas in india where cloud burst events are very frequent then we saw the consequences of cloud burst and finally we saw the steps that can be taken to adapt to cloud burst i hope this discussion was helpful so with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article now let us take up this news article the article speaks about the india pacific economic framework that is ipef this is a news because in the recent ministerial meet of ipef india stayed out of the joint declaration on the trade pillar which is one of the four pillars of the ipef now in this context we will learn about the india pacific economic framework its four pillars and india stand on the pillars of the framework first let us see about the indo pacific economic framework see the indo pacific economic framework that is the ipef was launched by the us president joe biden in tokyo on march 2022 the ipef seeks to strengthen economic relations between 
all the participating nations by enhancing resilience sustainability inclusiveness economic growth fair treatment and competitive spirit in the indo-pacific region it also aims to provide a us led alternative to china's economic footprint in the region ipf has 14 member states and these member states represents 40% of the world gdp the member states are australia brunei fiji india indonesia japan south korea malaysia new zealand philippines singapore thailand united states and vietnam these are the basic facts about the indo pacific economic framework now let us see about the four pillars of the framework first is the trade pillar through this trade pillar the ipef plans to or aims to build a high standard inclusive and free and fair trade commitments it also aims to develop new and creative approach to trade and technology policy the second is the supply chain pillar through this the ipf aims to ensure a more resilient and well integrated supply chain this can be achieved by incorporating transparency diversity security and sustainability in the supply chain in the indo pacific region also it focuses on crisis response by expanding better cooperation see this supply chain pillar is important because the covid pandemic showed us that the world's supply chain is excessively dependent on china when supply from china was affected the total global economy was affected so the ipef aims to create a supply chain by excluding china this will reduce china's influence on the world economy the third is the clean energy decarbonization and infrastructure pillar through this the ipef plans to decarbonize the economies and build climate resilient infrastructure see earlier in our discussion we saw about cloud burst right so if we build better infrastructure we can adapt our infrastructure to environmental impacts like cloud burst also by decarbonizing the economy climate change can be addressed and countries can also adhere to the paris climate commitment this will also help provide sustainable livelihood to the people and the workers the fourth pillar is the tax and anti corruption pillar see in this the ipef plans to create a anti money laundering and anti bribery regime to curb tax evasion and corruption in the indo pacific region by curbing tax evasion and corruption in the region fair and transparent competition can be ensured in the region this will help in the sustainable development of the countries involved in the ipef see these are the four basic pillars of the ipef now let's see india stand on the four pillars of the framework in the recent ministerial meeting of ipef that happened in los angeles india have joined in three out of the four pillars which are related to supply chain tax and anti corruption and clean energy see india was comfortable with the outcome and text of these three pillars so india joined in these three pillars but india did not join in the trade pillar because as we all know india is a emerging economy the text in the trade pillar relating to environment labor digital trade and public procurement was not inclusive of india's concerns since india's concerns were not addressed in the trade pillar india did not join so that's all regarding the news and the discussion see in this we saw about ipef that is indo pacific economic framework we saw about its members and the four pillars of the framework we also saw why india joined in three pillars and did not join in the trade pillar so that's all regarding this discussion with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article take a look at this faq article this article talks about the economic importance of kushiyara river for bangladesh and the rahimpura canal for people who want to know about the geography of the river kushiyara we have extensively covered this aspect on our hindu news analysis dated 8th september 2022 so in this discussion we will be focusing only on the economic importance of the kushiyara river for bangladesh see If you have seen our 8th September 2022 news analysis you must have known that Kushiara is a distributary of Barak 
the river Barak separates into Kushiara and Surma. The river Barak is notorious because the river frequently shifts its path. Due to this, most of the water from river Barak flows into the Kushiya river and only some water flows into the Surma river. Due to this, in the monsoon season, Bangladesh is heavily flooded. But during the winter season or during the lean season, the water in the Kushiara river is very low. See, Bangladesh mainly in the northeastern part cultivate the boro rice. Here boro rice means rice that is cultivated in the winter season. This rice requires water, right? So, the water for the boro rice cultivation is supplied by the Kushiara river. Since during the lean season, the water in the Kushiara river is very low, the cultivation of boro rice is affected. Also, Sailhet is famous for its vegetables. This vegetable cultivation also depends on the water in the Kushiara river. So, basically, less water in the Kushiara river during the winter season is the issue. Here is the importance of the Kushiara River Treaty. After the treaty is finalized, Bangladesh will receive its fair share of the Kushiara River during the winter season. This will help in the cultivation of boro rice and the vegetable cultivation in the seal hut region. The article says that through this treaty, Bangladesh will be able to withdraw 153 cusack of water from the Kushiara River out of the approximately 2500 cusack of water in the river during the winter season. Normally, it is reported that water will be now useful for the cultivation in around 10,000 hectares of land in the Bangladeshi side of the border. This will greatly help the Bangladeshi people. Here, what is cusack? Here, cusack is the unit of measurement of flow of water. Cusack means cubic feet per second. So, this is the economic importance of the treaty. See, this article also talks about the Rahimpur Canal. See, Rahimpur Canal is the river canal located in the eastern part of Bangladesh in Sailhut. The water of the Kushiara River will be channeled through this canal. The canal was built to help the Bangladeshi farmers access the river Kushiara's water. India objected to the construction activity in the canal. This has resulted in the reduction of the utility of the river. Due to India's objection, the utility of both the river and the Rahimpur canal during the winter season has gone down. This has affected the boro rice cultivation as well as the vegetable cultivation in Sealhut. But now, as the Kushiara river sharing agreement is finalized, India has taken back its objection. This will help Bangladesh use the Kushiara river and the Rahimpur canal effectively. So, through this agreement, India and Bangladesh will become closer. It will also reduce Chinese influence in Bangladesh. Like this, all the issues between India and Bangladesh should be smoothly ironed out. So, that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the economic importance of the Kushiara River for Bangladesh. We also saw what is boro rice cultivation. Finally, we saw the importance of Rahimpur Canal. That's all regarding this discussion. With this, let us conclude the news article discussion session and take up the practice prelims questions. We have three practice prelims questions today. Let's see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. It is a two statement question. Two statements regarding neuromorphic computing is given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. Neuromorphic computing refers to computational method which are modeled like human brain and nervous system. See, this statement is correct. We saw about this statement in our discussion itself. So, moving on to the second statement. At present, both neuromorphic computing and quantum computing does not need any cooling system unlike conventional computers. See, this statement is incorrect. Only neuromorphic computers do not need cooling system. But quantum computers at present use cooling system to keep their temperatures very low. So, statement 2 is incorrect. Since statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect, the correct answer here is option A, one only. Moving on to the second question. See here, three rivers are given. They are asking us to find the transboundary rivers between India and Bangladesh. Here, Tista and Barak are transboundary rivers present in between India and Bangladesh. But Kaladan is not a transboundary river. You would have heard about the name Kaladan in the recent times due to the development of the Kaladan multimodal transit transport project. Kaladan is a transboundary river between 
India and Myanmar. So the correct answer here is option C, 1 and 2 only. Moving on to the last question. This is a quiz question for you. Interested aspirants, find the answer for this question and post it in the comment section. The main question based on today's discussion is displayed here. Write the answers and post it in the comment section. That's all regarding today's discussion. If you like today's video, like, comment and share it with your friends. For more updates regarding UPSC preparation, subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.